The Great Smoky Mountains are some of the oldest mountains in the entire world. They have witnessed the shaping of continents, the rising of tides, and the formation of the terrain around them. These majestic mountains are known for their beauty, but they are also home to many natural resources, including miles and miles of timber. For years, human settlers of this region, mainly the Cherokee and their ancestors, lived in harmony with the region, as they only took from the mountains what they needed. With the introduction of the Industrial Revolution to America, the mass production of timber by way of logging became a major focus of corporations. Thus, the Smoky Mountains were chosen as a logging destination. Logging camps and processing facilities skyrocketed in the 19th century. Even though these logging companies produced timber for the country to use, they were ridding the country of one of its most beautiful destinations. Fortunately, the creation of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park stopped any further damage being done to the area, but there are long-term damages that still need to be remedied. Twenty years after the Civil War, profiteers recognized the potential that the Smoky Mountain Forest had when it came to providing timber. They knew they could cut down and process these trees by simply buying remote land in the mountains. Without any human population or government regulations nearby, they were free to do whatever they wanted. By the 1880s, logging companies had already severely devastated forests in the northeast and west sections of the country. Naturally, they needed a new region of the country to exploit. They chose the wondrous forest ridges and valleys of the Smoky Mountains in Greater Appalachia. As you know, many of the hardwood forests in the mountains can be difficult to get to, especially for any logging equipment. Because of this, most of the new logging efforts took place outside of the massive Smoky Mountains and were relegated to the valleys and outer mountain ranges. Once these sources ran out, the logging companies pushed on deeper into the Smoky Mountains to rid them of what made them unique. Only a few years into the logging boom, a Waynesville mill had an order of 4 million board feet of walnut timber. This completely eviscerated walnut trees from the Smoky Mountains region. This was the destruction the companies caused. A key piece of the puzzle when it came to mountain logging was the vast water system the Smoky Mountains provided. Loggers would purchase large timberlands upstream from rivers so they could easily transport their logs to the processing plants. Rivers such as the Little Tennessee, Hazel Creek, and the Tuckasegee were exhaustingly used in this fashion. The process began with teams of oxen high on the summits of mountains dragging logs behind them. Once at the top, loggers would release the logs down through a clearing in the mountain to slam into the river and start the float downstream. Cut logs would flow down the river until they reached a dam where they could be collected. Once collected, they could be processed on site or moved to other locations for processing. Of course, this logging technique would create dangerous conditions for both workers and ecosystems throughout the transport line. When heavy rainfall occurred, the ground would become wet and weak, which led to countless logs rushing down mountains, flowing down river by the hundreds, oftentimes shredding the dams that were supposed to hold them for processing, and slamming them into riverbanks further downstream. Rather than clean up this mess, loggers simply left the logs where they finished floating to, as they were no longer valuable to the company due to the damage they experienced during the flood. Loggers quickly fell into a catch-22. They knew that deep in the Smoky Mountain Forest, there were extremely valuable swaths of timberlands ripe for the taking. But they couldn't reach them due to treacherous terrain, so they came up with a way to overcome their problem. Portable sawmills. These portable sawmills were able to reach the lower areas of difficult terrain, which meant they could process the timber on site once it came down the log chute from the mountaintops. They would then load the lumber onto wagons and transport them to a nearby railroad. By the time the end of the 19th century rolled around, loggers had completely stripped creeks of their valuable timber. While this destruction left many forests with holes in them, the loggers' inefficiency ended up saving some forests from destruction. Because of this inefficiency, the ecosystems where logging had taken place could eventually repair themselves over time. The inefficiency and instability of the logging industry combined to put most loggers out of business by the turn of the 20th century. These simple and inefficient logging companies would fall victim to themselves and be abandoned for a time. As is the case in America, those failed corporations simply came back better than ever and with a vengeance this time. A more robust timber industry and more efficient logging techniques would thrust Smoky Mountain logging into phase two in the early 20th century. In 1890, North Carolina completed the infamous Murphy Branch of the Southern Railway. This railroad traveled from Asheville to deep in the forests of western North Carolina. Lumber companies heralded the railroad's completion, as they now had a direct line of transport to mills and markets.
In 1908, the pulp mill in Canton, North Carolina, was introduced to the industry in the railway transport line. The pulp mill specialized in creating byproducts of lumber, which became crucial to the success of the logging industry. During the early 1900s, logging companies flocked to and fought over timberlands they wanted to purchase. They divided western North Carolina and parts of the Tennessee Smokies into the tracts of land they desired and purchased them on the spot. Once the timberlands had been purchased by the logging companies, the next logical step was to bring transport directly to the mills and timberlands. So they did. The standard railroad would be added to the existing railway to service newly built mills. As the loggers cut deeper into the timberlands, the railroad would follow them. Then came the Little River Railroad, a Tennessee construction that would cost $360,000 at the time to build. 18 miles of the line would be laid after workers blasted out the rocky gorge by the river. The track of the Little River Railroad would test the limits of railroading as some curves reached 36 degrees with many other of similar severity. Many logging companies copied the Little River Railroad and ventured to take their railways further into hazardous terrain than ever before. Some laid tracks until they reached the bottom of the highest mountains in the Smokies. Others pushed on and laid tracks at an elevation of 5,000 feet or more. Almost 200 miles of railroad were being used to produce and process timber by the time World War I broke out. This was the peak of logging in the Smoky Mountains, even though technologies were just now beginning to ramp up through invention. With the introduction of steam power to industries across the world, mass production became the norm. Additionally, the previous limitations that human production came with were no longer an issue, especially in the logging industry. No longer did companies have to find unique ways to reach difficult terrain or high elevations. Instead, they could attack them directly with newly invented steam machines. A particularly important steam machine was the cable car. A cable could be attached high up on the mountain they would pull a cable car up and down the mountain to allow much easier access to timberlands. Due to the cost of these steam-powered machines, however, logging companies still used flumes, rivers, and mountain logs used to transport logs when it was convenient or necessary. While the steam-powered logging machines greatly reduced the work human workers had to take on, they directly caused a massive uptick in the destruction of forests. The reason for this was that loggers no longer had to carefully pick the best lumber candidates to cut down but now could simply cut them all down and transport them within the same time frame. This led to many more trees being cut down and wasted if they couldn't take them to market. As the logging industry became more efficient, the industry continued to grow. Mechanical logging machines led to higher lumber production, which led to the specialization of the lumber workforce. Operators of machinery that were specifically trained were needed, as were other specialties. Specialization became more and more focused as logging companies looked more like modern corporations than ever before. One of the most prominent lumber companies that would be considered a modern company was the Little River Lumber Company. While most logging companies stuck to the North Carolina side of the Smokies, Little River Lumber focused their efforts around the Little River in Tennessee up to Elkmont, Tennessee. Little River Lumber dominated the early 1900s and implemented most of these modern strategies before any other companies. By the time Little River shut down in 1939, it would have been responsible for the loss of 1.5 billion board feet of lumber in the Tennessee Smoky Mountains. Conventional logic would infer that the creation of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park stopped logging in its tracks. While that is true when it came to the National Park itself, it isn't the entire story. By the 1920s, many logging companies had exhausted the timber resources and the timber lands they purchased at the turn of the century. Many of them left and moved on to other tracts of land away from the Smokies. Those that kept on logging did so outside of the National Park in western North Carolina. Even today, logging is still occurring in the eastern Smoky Mountains in North Carolina. In general, it is difficult to point out former logging areas. In fact, most of these formerly logged pieces of land have experienced second growth and are now covered again with forest, albeit a much younger forest. Nearly every single road, main trail, railroad, or clearing was used in some way by the logging companies of old. Most visitors of the National Park and the Greater Smoky Mountains wouldn't even know they were traveling on the same paths that logging companies once cleared. Even though many logging timberlands were able to grow back and repair themselves, logging forever changed the natural landscape of spruce fir trees in the Smoky Mountains. Interestingly, spruce fir trees logged on the southern slopes of the Smokies did not regrow or repair themselves.
northern-facing spruce firs were able to repopulate their natural regions. This has resulted in the elevation of the spruce fir forest of the Smoky Mountains being significantly higher than the north side, an average of 100 meters across the mountain range. To clarify the scale of this, think of it like this. To clarify the scale of this, think of it like this. The spruce fir forest line began 100 meters higher than it used to on the south slopes of the Smokies due to rampant logging. This can seem like a small issue, but because the Smokies have such a diverse range of natural species, many of them could have been wiped out in the slogging area. Throughout the history of the Great Smoky Mountains, a great change has taken place. They have seen landmass change, oceans grow, and entire civilizations run their course. The modern industrial era destroyed many of the mountains' natural resources in the name of progress in society. This is natural, of course, and happens in nearly every single human society at some point. But if we can simply think about the consequences before rushing into these natural resources without a healing plan, then we could leave our natural lands off better than when we came.